We're not living for the Lord. We're not serving Him. And the things that we use for excuses not to be obedient to Scripture, they're, they're, they're not anything. And, you know, we look at history and we look at even today the church that's under great persecution. You know what? If you believe in Christ as your Savior, you'll probably die for it, and so it better mean something to you. And if you believe Christ is your Savior and you're willing to die for it, then you'll probably live a little bit differently. And we need some purifying in our church. You know, in the early church, they said the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. The more Christians they killed, the more came to Christ because it was real. And I fear that our Christianity, and I have no idea about the hearts of individuals, but I fear that our Christianity is not real enough for us to live. And a Christianity that's not real enough to live, uh, friend, you have to ask God to, to, to judge your heart and to reveal it to you. And we need to have some hard times to put us in perspective. You know, the scripture teaches very plainly that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know one of the things I've discovered in preaching the gospel in America is that everybody in America is wealthy. For the most part, I'm telling you, say, Pastor, you don't understand, I'm going to restrict I'm telling you, anybody who can eat anytime they want to are filthy, is filthy rich. And that's a fact. When I got to memorize scripture just to motivate myself to run a mile, just to motivate myself to take off some pounds because I eat too much because of so much opportunity, there's a problem with wealth, or not a problem with wealth. I'm just telling you, we're wealthy. And I'm telling you, I'm rich beyond measure in comparison to a lot of different individuals. So you and I, Christian, must come to a place where we understand our personal responsibility before holy God to measure up. And I'm not talking about to measure up to the standard of righteousness so we can be saved, but I mean to be what God has enabled us to be through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the introduction to this little excerpt that we're going to make by way of application. Now, we've seen the Apostle Paul's, uh, if you will, admonishment, about admonishment to the Gentiles, saying, hey, this is what it means for you to be on your own spiritually. I can't be there. I can't watch over you. I can't protect you. I can't make you do right. So you've got to do it yourself. And now we see in verse 16, his personal call. And I would ask you to go a step beyond seeing your responsibility to God for your own spiritual well-being and to see that God has something for you as relates to others. Here's Paul talking about his particular ministry. What is a ministry? What is a ministration? It's a, uh, an opportunity to serve. A minister is a person who takes care of the needs of others. If I were to have a personal minister, his job would be to go around and take care of my needs. He'd see what I needed and take care of it. And as a minister of the gospel, my job is to meet spiritual needs of others, uh, whatever those needs are. And now the Apostle Paul is talking about his particular job as a servant. By the way, there's different ministers, aren't there? Different servants. Uh, you go to a restaurant. There's different ministers in a, in a restaurant. There's a person who stands at the front, and they're the greeter slash seater. And so their servant job is is to greet you and to find you a place to be seated. And then you'll have a person maybe who comes in, maybe a couple of people. Their job is to make sure that you have the things that you need at your table. Their job is to make sure that you've got something to drink and make sure that you get your order taken care of and that you have all of your food. And that's their job. And then there's a minister that comes along, along with that. That's the bus boy. And their job is to make sure that the table gets cleared and things get out of your way. And so that's part of their job. And I know that those positions can be mixed or whatever, but understand it's a job and a servant. And the Apostle Paul had a job in the church. And Christian, I want to remind you, you've got a job in this church. You ought to see yourself as a member of the part of as a member of the body, as a part of this church, and ask yourself the question: what is my ministry in this ministry? If we are to serve the lost in Fort Lauderdale and preach the gospel to, of Jesus Christ, if we're to be ministers one to another, the question is, where is our particular ministry? And the Apostle Paul describes his ministry this way, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. So he says, I, I, it's a grace that's given to me of God. Grace means God's power, God's ability. And you need to understand that as God has called you to serve, He has not asked you to go and figure out how to do something. He said, go and do this, and I'll give you the ability to do it. 
It's amazing to me when I see that not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath used the foolish things of this world to confound the mighty, the weak things, or to confound the wise, the weak things to confound the mighty, and it goes on, and I can't quote it exactly. Maybe that would be a verse you could memorize and it would help me because I'd get it down and be able to quote it better. It's in 1 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, learn that and come say it to me, and then that will be helpful for me. Good challenge. It is our responsibility to see our job as a minister of the gospel to understand what our calling is. And it's more than just for us, it's for others. And Paul is talking about this grace. And friend, God gives you grace. Grace is God's special ability. Have you ever thought, man, I wish that person would get saved. They're so nice. They'd just be so good in our church. How about the mean person that could be made nice by God's grace? How about the crab? He's never cared about anything but himself who gets saved and by God's grace loves everybody and is willing to serve. How about the selfish person? How about the mean person? How about the whatever? God gives us grace and you may fit in. How about the guy who just doesn't have any talents? I mean, you can barely read and you can barely write and you always have a hard time communicating and, you know, it's just a thing that I can do and it's all I can do. How about God's grace to do better or do something that's beyond that? And the Apostle Paul, if you can understand, is a Hebrew. I mean, when he talks about his calling as a Hebrew, he makes it very plain that he was a Pharisee and he was a Hebrew, and that meant that he was not a Gentile. And I'm telling you something. If you just would understand, it's hard for us in our culture to really understand this. There's racism in our culture. But there's not a lot of the ethnic division like there was in this time. And literally, a Gentile was a dog. And a dog was not cool. A dog was, um, and I, I don't know how we could phrase something disgusting, a, a pig and a dog in Jewish culture was just untouchable, unthinkable, was awful. And God saved Paul and gave him a ministry to the dogs, if you will. I mean, what if he, you know, how about the, you know, the on-the-edge Jews, the publicans, but they're Jewish at least, and the tax collectors, and they're, they may be traitors of their country, but at least they're still Jewish. Or what if he just give them a job to convert the Pharisees? Well, I'd be writing Paul, I mean, that'd been his, his home people. They'd have been the people that he knew and were his friends and his family, and he felt comfortable with them, and God sent him to be in a culture of outcasts as far as Jewish individuals were concerned, and that was by the grace of God. There was no difference between... He, he, here the Paul, Paul is expressing the truth that there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And you have to understand that that would not have been what he would have said before he was saved. He was changed by God's grace, and now he had a ministry to people that he would have never have looked at himself as having a ministry to. Christian, let me ask you a question. What's your attitude with regard to who God wants you to minister to? Do you, have, do you have a ministry to the down and outers or the up and outers? Who is it that you see yourself as having an obligation before holy God to? You ought to be in prayer about that and consider that. The Apostle Paul had a conviction that he was a minister to the Gentiles. Here's a second perspective on these individuals. No background. He said, I have whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. And he's speaking of the things that he knows. And he's talking about his apostleship, of his high calling. And he said, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Now he said to the church, You're able to do right and to be admonished. And now he's going to refer to the fact that here's a church that is what they were not before. And it's by God's grace, and it is absolutely amazing what God has done. You know, it's wonderful what God can do. And it's, it's, it is nothing, is it, for somebody to get saved and just, they already lived and acted like a Christian, and, and they never sinned in their life before, and so it wasn't any problem for them to have spiritual victory because they had no sin that they needed to overcome. And it's a, there's no Christian like that. Everybody who's saved is saved by God's grace. And they're saved because they're lousy and they're wicked and they're rotten and their sin is against God and they're his person.